This week on the All American Legacy Podcast. Freedom is not a thing you can win once and for all. He's like, so where are you headed? And I handed him the paper and he looks at it and he's like, going to the 82nd. And I was like, yeah, sure am. He's like, you're going to catch a lot of stuff going there. <laughs> this is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All-American Legacy Podcast, an inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are All-American all the way. Welcome back to the All-American Legacy Podcast. I'm Master Sergeant Patrick Malone. If you have not listened to last week's episode, stop. Go back and listen to part one of An Army of One, and then come back. This is a continuation of the story of Sergeant Alvin York. We left off last week with Sergeant York's valorous actions in the Argonne Forest of France on October 8, 1918. And that is exactly where we'll pick it up now. Act 3. Reluctant Hero. Now... Let's get the story of post-war Alvin York. Lieutenant Colonel Bacino spoke with retired Army Colonel Gerald York, one of Alvin's grandsons. Gerald is the chairman of the Sergeant York Patriotic Foundation in Pall Mall, Tennessee. It was an article in the April 29th, 1919 Saturday Evening Post that really made your grandfather a national celebrity. And, and as the division, as the 82nd began movement back to the United States, Sergeant York knew nothing of this article. He was surprised by reporters on the deck of the USS Ohio as it docked in Hoboken, New Jersey in uh, May 1919. And then from that point on, he was, he was really a reluctant hero. Why was he so uncomfortable with the attention that he was paid? It had always bothered him all of his life that uh, he had taken another life in his latter days. He asked my father, do you think that was justified? And so it wasn't something he wanted to capitalize on. And also he felt like his, his attitude was, uh, why am I getting all this attention? I just did what anyone would do. I did my duty. There was controversy about the official story almost immediately with reporters questioning how he could have done all this by himself. and. Other soldiers from the 82nd also were critical of the official story. And, and that really continued through his life. How did he feel about that controversy? When the controversy came up, he said, look, when they filled out their affidavits, nobody forced them to, to say anything. He said, you know, they told, I told my story of what I saw, and they told their story of what they saw. He used his clout not for personal gain and, and, and avoided personal gain, but he did use his clout to improve conditions in Pall Mall and, and got highways paved, looked for educational opportunities, had schools built. Uh, when, he, when he came back home, he had basically the equivalent of about a third grade education, uh, pretty much self-taught, read a lot. And when he came back, he had seen the world, he'd been to France, he'd been to New York, he'd been and, and seen that the world was much greater than just the mountains where he came from. He felt like that for the kids of the mountains, in Pall Mall and in the region of uh, Tennessee, for them to be competitive in a world that was coming, that they had to have an education. He ran into a lot of opposition. He ran into opposition from the people in the county he was from because for them, they did not want uh, their kids to get a, an education because they needed them on the farm. They were against any kind of school, long-term school, that took them away from that. His goal was to build a, uh, a high school and a trade school. The high school is still going today, by the way. and. The, but he traveled around the country. He built the high school. He hired the teachers, uh, hired the staff, paid the teachers, paid the staff, bought the buses, paid, bought the gas, paid the bus drivers. He basically funded the school through the proceeds from his books, 
that had been written about him and also from donations that people gave. He brought education to a mountain region that didn't have it. At some point in there in the 1920s, despite all of his fame, somehow he became impoverished. He was given the uh, farm uh, and, and the house. The house wasn't completed, but when he returned from France, they presented him with the, uh, with, the, with the title to his house and the land, the farm, uh, but it wasn't paid for. So he had a mortgage on the farm and he was having trouble uh, meeting that mortgage. Then when he actually uh, got some contributions and, and paid the farm, then he actually had to mortgage the farm twice to pay the teachers and run the school. He went out and became more of a fundraiser, traveled more, gave more speeches, and that was able to, to pay, off, uh, pay off the debts that he had accumulated in running the school. In, in 1941, the world was once again at war. The U.S. was in the midst of a debate about entering the war, World War II. Many people that followed his story were surprised when he became a public advocate for U.S. intervention in the war, despite his anti-war beliefs. His feeling when he came back from World War I was that they had, they had won and that they had gained freedom and that uh, that was the great war that to end all wars and uh, that there wouldn't be any more conflict. And so he was pretty much an isolationist during that period of time. He felt like the U.S. should just stay with the U.S., shouldn't get involved in, in world affairs outside of, outside of the country. He became convinced in the 30s, freedom's not something you can win once and you have it forever. My grandfather I was convinced to make the movie, the movie Sergeant, he worked with Gary Cooper. Uh, they had been after him since 1919 to make the movie. And he basically said no, you know, that. So they came at him again in the late 30s and said, look, patriotism is at a low ebb. We think it would be very good to make a movie about, about your life. And we think that would help patriotism. A portion of it, uh, he agreed. Actually enlisted, tried to enlist in uh, in World War II. He was a little old and a little overweight at the time, so uh, uh, they they said they would commission him in the Signal Corps, and he went around the country speaking the truth. How involved was your grandfather in the development of the movie? He was he was very involved. He kind of wanted to have veto authority over who played him and his wife. So he wanted to kind of uh, have say so. And he said he wanted to not to Hollywoodize his story. He wanted the story to be uh, as accurate as possible. My favorite part of the movie is when his, his company commander, um, Major Buxton and Captain Danforth, I believe, are talking to him and, and they, they offer him a promotion and he turns down the promotion, and, and they talk to him about the ideals of, of, of America. You're a religious man, York. Yes, sir. You want to worship God in your own way. Yes, sir. You're a farmer. Yes, sir. You want to plow your fields as you see fit and raise your family according to your own lights. And that's your heritage, and mine, every American is. But the cost of that heritage is high. Sometimes it takes all we have to preserve it, even our lives. How are you going to answer that, York? Wow. It doesn't give me a powerful lot to be a thinking about. And I think there were some real lessons in leadership. They tried to understand the soldier and tried to understand the man and what was motivating him. They could have, they could have ended it right there, uh, letting him go home, dismissing. Mm -hmm. But they tried to they, they tried to work with him, and my grandfather thought a lot of uh, Major Buxton. And, and Grandpa said that uh, Major Buxton had asked him, "Hey, if you if, when you have kids, I'd be an honor if you ever named one after me." And so he did. He named his second son 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was he? Did he feel a real call to the 82nd? Um, he did. Uh, he, did. He, in fact, he went down at the activation of the 82nd in World War II. He actually mm-hmm. went down and spoke to the division. The York family remains committed to preserving the Alvin York legacy. Act 4, All-American. Gerald York mentioned Sergeant Alvin York's return to the All-American Division in May 1942. He addressed the troops of the newly established 82nd Airborne Division at Camp Claiborne. Here is that address. Alvin York, now 55, is introduced by the commanding general of the 82nd, Major General Omar Bradley. General Bradley was, of course, the first commander of the division in its airborne configuration. On October 8, 1918, Sergeant Alvin C. York, a member of the 82nd American Division, captured almost single-handed 132 German officers and men. For this feat... He was designated as the outstanding soldier of the AEF. The 82nd Division, known then and now as the All-American Division, has been reactivated and is now assembled on a hillside here at Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. Every present member of the division hopes to emulate the example set by Sergeant York. Today, the War Department announced the appointment of Sergeant York as a major in the Army of the United States. Men of the 82nd Division, here is your Sergeant York. Thank you, General Bradley. I'm mighty proud to be here with my old division, the 82nd, even if it's only for a visit. The old 82nd was mustered out after the last war, but in the hearts of the men who served with it over there... The All-American Division never was and never could be mustered out. I'll never forget my first day with the old outfit at Camp Gordon, Georgia. It was in November 1917. Being here with the 82nd again is a peculiar feeling. It's like living something all over. Here you boys are training to finish the job we thought we had done for all time. The job of keeping our country's freedom from going under the heels of the dictator. Last time after the Germans hung out the white rag and we sailed home, we thought there'd never be another war. We doe boys didn't realize then, and some of the men in the higher places didn't realize that freedom is not a thing you can win once and for all. We never owned freedom... We only got a lease on it. A payment came due in 17 and 18. Now another one is due. But this time we're going to make such a big payment that it'll be a many of a year before another one is demanded of us. (laughs) The Germans have always underestimated us Americans. I remember one day back in the Argonne, when we took several prisoners, I noticed one German corporal looking us over, mildly puzzled. He could speak a little English. He asked if all of us in the outfit were Americans. We told him we were. He just shook his head. Didn't seem that he could take it at all. You see, the All-American Division was made up of boys from all over the country. There, there were boys from uh, the mountains like me and boys from the small towns and cities. There were Southerners, New Yorkers, Middle Westerners, as well as boys from the cow country in the Pacific Coast. Sergeant York's story is part of the All-American story and has been for 100 years. 
We spoke with another Sergeant York about the all-American bloodline running through the family. I'm Sergeant Jacob York. I'm assigned to Bravo Troop 173 Cav- Cavalry Squadron in the 82nd Airborne Division. So what is it like to be Sergeant York in the 82nd Airborne Division? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good feeling, uh, knowing that long, long ago, Alvin York was the Sergeant York of the 82nd Division, and 100 years later, here I am making that rank as, as well, being a Sergeant York here. Uh, don't try to do too many things to follow in his footsteps per se and just try to make it my own career and progress the best way I know how. And Sergeant York was your, what, your grand uncle? Yes, yeah, so it was my great uncle. My uh, great grandfather and Alvin York were brothers. So, how often do you hear about York and Sergeant York? We obviously have York Theater here, and this is the division that. Alvin York saved, the division certainly could have gone the other way historically had Alvin York not taken the action he did on October 8th in that forest in 1918. So how often do you hear about that? It would almost be, if not once a week, every other week. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anything that comes to training or any kind of physical training event, pretty much anything that involves some kind of competition – I always get those looks of people's sarcastic attitudes being, well, you're a York, so you're going to come out on top? Or uh, pretty much they want to piggyback off me, but it it comes up more often than than I think it would. Yeah. I feel like you were destined to be an E5 assigned to this division, but how did that come about? When I first um, went up to the recruiting station, uh, I, I applied for, put on all the paperwork and wanted to go combat arms. And my father came in. I, I mean, I didn't know too much about what was going on in the Army. My dad was previously in the Army and uh, airborne qualified, air, air assault qualified. So he walked in there and told my recruiter, we need to get him airborne school. And my recruiter was like, well, who are you? He's like, <laughs> well, I was in the Army before and I know how all this works. So let's get him airborne school. So I go to basic training with an uh, airborne school contract, uh, immediately following um, OSIT training and go to airborne school. While in OSIT, um, on, my, on my ERB or on my AKO account, had orders to Fort Bragg. That's where the initial orders came down from. Then got to airborne school, graduated there. They handed me that packet and, of course, Fort Bragg right there on the orders. So that's when I really knew I was coming here. And then what did you say to your father? What was the conversation? Uh, I let him know. He, so he asked me when I, when I graduated airborne school, he pinned my wings on me, and he's like, so where are you headed? And I handed him the paper, and he looks at it, and he's like, going to the 82nd. And I was like, yeah, I sure am. He's like, you're going to catch a lot of stuff going there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm always surprised how many people in the 82nd don't, do not know the full story of Alvin York. I think they know roughly who he is, but... Within this division, we have, along with Audie Murphy, perhaps the most famous soldier in United States military history. Are you sometimes surprised by that, or or, or do you have a sense that it's a well-understood story? Uh, A lot of people really don't know the whole story. I mean, they know the name because a lot of people have to know it for Soldier of the Month board, promotion board. So people know the name and know he was a Medal of Honor recipient, but... It is kind of surprising for for how how crucial that story is in the 82nd's history and in America's history, for that matter, in the world's history. I mean, people people in France and Germany know know the story better than a lot of us do. Oh yeah. So it, it is kind of surprising. I mean, a lot of people know the name, but people will be like, "Oh, you're related to Sergeant York," and they'd be like, "I know he got a Medal of Honor, but what did he do again?" And I mean, it's not it doesn't like give me hurt feelings or anything, but I mean, just a lot of people might not have taken the time or been taught. It's really something that you would have to look into or or be told by somebody. It's not one of those things you're just going to know off common knowledge. So, 
One of the interesting things about history, one of the fascinating things is that you can always try to wonder what paths history would have gone down had things gone another way. And, and I wonder if the if the country and the army and the War Department would have reconstituted the 82nd had Sergeant York not saved the division. So I, I wonder if we potentially wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Alvin York. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was it solely just came down to, I mean, we would like to think if any soldier was placed in that situation that something similar may have happened. I mean, um, here, here Alvin York is getting gunned down by a machine gun nest and multiple leaders taken out, and he's one of the near highest ranking. And, I mean, his thought processes from from everything that I've heard from the story and family is that it's either it's either them or me. So how can I protect myself and my battle buddies from them and then made all his decision-making moves from there? So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's just the right place, right time kind of thing, but it's it's that moral background that he had leading up to that point and then, then how all the dominoes fell for that entire situation to play out the way it did. If he would have just hit down like the rest of his team and not made that move, there's no telling what may have happened because we all know that he he brought in many high, high leaders in that capture. Then it wasn't a bunch of corporals and sergeants in the German army. It was majors, generals, things of that nature. So, And Colonel Douglas Mastriano told us that it just goes to show how one man can make a difference and that really is true throughout our history. Uh, there's There have been... Uh, Many instances of, of whether it's fate or right, right place, right time, like you said, or, or a soldier, a paratrooper, just uh, doing what, uh, falling back on that training. Um, so you're from Florida, but you've been mm-hmm. to Pell Mell. Yes, I have. I've, uh, more than once. I've probably been there two or three times. And what's that like? I imagine that that whole area. I have not been, but I imagine that whole area is. Oh yeah, it takes you. It takes you way back to it's. It's not any any place that's modern, so to say. There. Mm. Really old school, still there, um, still rural. Um, so it, you still, when you when you show up to that to that farm there that Alvin York's house is on, it takes you all the way back to early 1900s. Sergeant York, thank you for your time. Thank you. That is the full story of Sergeant Alvin York, from the hills of Pall Mall to the battlefields of France, back to those remote hills, and decades later to the silver screen and the imagination of a country. Today, Sergeant York serves as an ideal, something to strive for. The United States could use more Sergeant Yorks, and the country could use more of the traits that made him who he is, humility, loyalty, and determination. Sergeant York is one of our all-American legends. Many came after him. They all live on in the hearts and minds of those who wear the AA patch. We in the 82nd Airborne Division are proud to embody a legacy forged in the trenches of St. Mihiel the hedgerows of Normandy, along the Mekong Delta, up the mountains of Afghanistan, and in the streets of Iraq. Those who have served in the division, thank you for your contribution to that legacy. Thanks for listening and for honoring our centennial. The All-American Legacy Podcast is produced by the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office. I'm Master Sergeant Patrick Malone, the host of these twin episodes. Thanks to the Army Center for Military History for allowing us access to their archives. Thanks to the Pritzker Military Museum and Library for allowing us to use their audio. Special thanks to Colonel Gerald York and the Sergeant York Patriotic Foundation. Thanks to all of you for listening to the All-American Legacy Podcast. Don't forget to share this with your friends, leave a rating and review, and let everyone know they can find the All-American Legacy podcast here on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever they get their podcasts from.